two, one. Hi everyone and welcome to our um, third webinar of a three-part series for the ASEAN Full Army Worm Action Plan Biocontrol Series in collaboration with CABI. We'll be starting in around one minute. Uh, we're just going to let everyone join uh, us and give them that time. So if you want to know how to interact today, which is very important and we encourage that, um, have a look at the uh, slide in front of you. Um, the main way of interacting will be using the Q&A box. So if you have any questions um, for any of our speakers, and we really encourage that, please use that Q&A box. Um, use the chat if you just want to give us a message, if you want to share a link, if you want to highlight an important point, um, you want to congratulate one of the speakers, please uh, feel free and, and do that in the chat. Uh, if you really want to say something, you can raise your hand and uh, you'll see under five there um, how to raise your hand. And if you could rename yourself, um, that would be uh, really useful too, putting your name and your organization. Um, but don't worry too much if you don't get around to doing that, but uh, have a good look at that. And just while you're here, I'll just give you a quick look at the agenda. It's a really full agenda today, so it's uh, quite exciting. Uh, and all our speakers are ready to go, so you will see them um, on the video now uh, waiting. So we've got 137 and actually quite a few people are joining, still joining. We had over 500 people register for this webinar, so uh, that's outstanding. Uh, we normally expect about half of the people to turn up. Um, so there will still be a lot of people uh, today joining us. And as you can see, this is webinar three. It's the last of a three-part series. Uh, we are looking at holding some technical workshop sessions in November. So um, we'll get in touch with you about that uh, soon. And I just wanted to highlight here, and, and Roger will be very happy from CABI here, but I think this is really important. There is a research collaboration portal uh, that CABI have um, put up, uh, and we really are um, encouraging people who are doing research in this area to, to share their research and, and um, you'll, you'll hear from others who are maybe working in the same area, but it will help grow the network. So, so I encourage you to do that. And we should be starting soon. I'll just um, hear from Pranav, our technical expert who is online and, and supporting us today. Um, Pranav's going to give me a countdown. So we're, we're really lucky. We're going to have a countdown uh, to recording, although I think recording might st already be on. I'm not sure. Prana? Yep, it is. Alison, go for it. Well, there we go. Shall we start? How many people do we have online? 156 at the moment. Okay. Well, I think we better get started because we have got a really busy agenda. Um, so welcome everyone to this to this third webinar of a three-part series. It's a pleasure to have you uh, join us. Uh, I am uh, Alison Watson and I'll be your moderator today. Uh, please make yourself familiar with the uh, platform here and how to use it. If you have any questions, as I said, if you were with me before, use the Q&A box to ask your questions to the speakers. And just use chat for general chat, uh, making a comment, uh, thanking a speaker, sharing a highlight. Um, and if you really want to say something today, you can also raise your hand. As you can see, we have a very full agenda. All our speakers are on video at the moment, so uh, they are all ready to go. Uh, it's gonna be a very action-packed agenda. We're, even, we, we're gonna try a video halfway through. Uh, we're, we're gonna see how that goes, but we're hoping it's running perfect because it's quite a um, quite a uh, interesting uh, video with great uh, pictures that I'm sure you're gonna enjoy. And we, what we do normally with all our webinars is we sort of get to know who you are. So I'm going to get Pranav to run a poll. Hopefully this works. And what I want you to do is um, choose what best describes the organization or sector you work for. And I'll give you about 20 seconds to choose that. Choose the best choice for yourself. Just to make it a bit different this time, you'll see that I've added uh, a couple more choices. So if you've been with us from series one, from part one, um, I, I've tried to diversify the choice a little bit. A 
and we might stop that soon. Pranav, how many people have we got? There we go. Wow. We've got 32% from government. So that's actually excellent to see. Um, nice to see that, that, that sector very strongly represented. Uh, private sector 18 and research 24 and 15 international organisations. Okay, that's very interesting. So thank you for joining us. It's nice to see that mix of people and we've still got a lot of people coming in. So I'm sure that, will, that would actually change by the end of the session. Um, but yes, thank you very much for joining us for those who have just come in. Okay, so next page, I'm going to move the... Here we go. I'm going to move to our uh, first introduction um, and this is uh, Graham Dixie, who's the Executive Director of Grow Asia. Welcome, Graham. Thank you, Alison, and, and welcome, everyone. It's, it's, uh, it's a privilege to say hello to you all and to thank you for attending. Um, we've had a sort of, I can see the numbers rising up at the bottom here, um, but this is the, first, for, the fourth in the series of webinars, um, all of which I've attended, and, and um, we got the numbers just now that something like 1,200 people have registered for these quote webinars and, and at least 800 have actually attended. And I have to say that I found them really interesting. Um, that, uh, and one of the things that has struck me about it is the depth of knowledge that we're picking out in the region, that we are having discussions on the size of granules or the flight path of a drone, some really very, very detailed conversations and obviously I think what we're picking up is the depth of knowledge in the region is, is far greater than we'd initially anticipated. But I think what these webinars are doing is something else, is knitting together those different people. And what we're seeing is some very interesting spillover effects where people are contacting one another, starting in talking about ways that they can work together, which is exactly what we wanted. But it's also building a broader body of knowledge so that rather than us knowing individually a lot about a, about a very small area, that we're being able to link that into the bigger, sto bigger storyline of what's going on globally, what's going on in the region, and what are the issues coming up in the fall. So I look forward to um, today's program, and I pass it back to you, Alison. Thank you. Thank you, Graham, for the introduction. Uh, and now I'd like to introduce uh, Roger Day from CABI. Thanks, Alison, and thank you, Graham, too. Um, Cabby is very pleased to be co-hosting this next webinar in the biocontrol series with uh, Croatia. Um, it's been an excellent series so far, and today is going to maybe even top the ones we've had already. Biocontrol is central to the IPM of fall armyworm. Um, I think we all know that. The challenge is to get it put into practice and, and getting biocontrol central to IPM is, is a challenge that I know we all face and our speakers today are experts in that so I'm look, very much looking forward to what they've got to say. The challenge is not only getting a method which works, it's getting it put into practice and put into practice cost effectively and, that, and that's the challenge I think we face so, so we look forward with interest to what our excellent speakers have to say. So welcome. Thank you very much, Roger. And it's been a pleasure for Grow Asia to work with Cabby as well. Uh, and I'd just like to welcome again all those government people across uh, ASEAN countries. Uh, it's, it's great to have you uh, on board and particularly the members of the expert working group on phytosanitary measures who are part of the task force. But uh, it's great to see 191 people on board already into this webinar. So without further ado, I'm going to stop my video. And then I'm going to move to our next slide where I'm going to introduce our first speaker, Chris um, and Graham and co. You can turn your videos off uh, if you would like and we'll just leave uh, uh, Dr. Rangaswamy Muniapin and uh, Muni for short. Uh, he is the director of the IPM Innovation Lab at Virginia Tech. Muni is an entomologist who has specialized in biological control and integrated pest management research in the tropics for more than 35 years. Uh, as program director for the IPM Innovation Lab, Mooney works with US aid and project partner institutions across the world, particularly uh, in Asia, Africa, Eastern Europe, obviously, uh, Car Caribbean and the Latin American countries, uh, and in Vietnam and Cambodia in Southeast Asia. Mooney, welcome. Thank you, Alison, and thank you, Graham and Alza Rajar. 
and I will start my presentation on the augmentation biological control of fall armyworm potential for Asian. Of course, there are quite a few slides will show some work that we have been carrying out in East Africa as well as in the South Asia region. Next slide, please. Okay. Biological control, as you all know, it has three categories, classical augmentation and conservation biological control. Class in the classical biological control, we introduce the natural enemies from the pest native range into the new area where the native natural enemies do not provide control. We had very good control of papaya mealybug in Asia by introducing a parasite from Mexico. That's a classical example. Recently, work was done on CAC controlling cassava mealybug in Southeast Asia. Chris and his colleagues did that work. So that is under classical biological control. Augmentative biological control is periodic release of uh, natural enemies. It also includes release of the, or spraying with the biopesticide. All those things that we repeatedly use in the field in a season we call as augmentative biological control. It's so like treating the seeds with trichoderma. It is a beneficial fungus and planting it uh, you know, that is one of the biological, uh, augmentative biological control cases. We also release of trichogramma, the egg parasite, for controlling different caterpillar pests that also come under augmentative biological control. Conservation biological control, of course, it is conserving the existing natural enemies in the system. And quite often it is done by reducing the chemical pesticide in the, in, in the field. Next one, please. Okay, under augmentative biological control, we have inoculative as well as uh, inundative. In the inoculative biological control, we just introduce the natural enemy in the early stage once and it multiplies and takes care of the pest in the field or in the greenhouse, like releasing the producious mite for controlling the uh, spider mites in the greenhouses or seed treatment with trichoderma once and it takes care of uh, the soil fun fungal problems by multiplying in the field. And in the inundative biological control, we have to keep releasing periodically so that uh, the natural enemies will stay in the field and take care of the pests. The same thing in the case of uh, multiple use spraying, multiple spraying with the biopesticides. Here I have given an example of the using the fungi, fungus for controlling the locusts. Even for, uh, for controlling some of the caterpillar pests, we use uh, inundative release of trichogramma. And there are several examples. Next one, please. Well, whenever a new pest or a, a you know, exotic pest gets, gets introduced into a new area, in the first one or two years, the population goes up and then the population will come down because the local natural enemies catch up with that population, it may come down and it may not go, come down below the economic injury level. In that case, we have to introduce some of the interventions either using chemical pesticide or biological control or different options we have to take so that we can bring that population below the economic threshold level. Hopefully like using classical biological control or augmentative biological control, we can bring that population below this level. So that is what we are aiming with the fall armyworm. Next one, please. Well, this slide was prepared about a year ago. So I'll try to collect the data. So you can see in the center of origin of the fall armyworm, that is the Americas there, they have identified several natural enemies, larval parasites alone about 150, sorry, larval natural enemies about 150. But in Africa in the last three years, they have found about four natural enemies. I think this year there are more have been identified in that region. In India, for example, within a year of it, follow me one introduction, they found uh, these many natural enemies and uh, still they are finding more natural enemies occurring in India on follow me one. Next one, please. Well, some of the agents that are being bred are at least being attempted to be bred in the laboratory and to be released in the field are trichogramma proteosum in South America and also in India. 
then trichogramma wanjai. Recently we found it in Tanzania and Kenya. It seems to be a very good parasite, uh, giving good parasitism against the fall armyworm. And we are producing it in Tanzania and Kenya now. Trichogramma kylonis, it has been found in different parts of Asia and Africa. That is also being reared in the laboratories. Trichogramma Atopo virilia, virilia, that is being reared and used in South America. Of course, Telnoma slimus, it is a very popular parasite and I will talk about it a little later in the next slide. And it is being reared in Asia as well as in Africa for augmentative release. There are also larval parasites like Brocon brevicornis that is being reared in India and Brocon Habitar, it occurs all over the world. It is being used for controlling different larva, different caterpillar pests. And it currently it is being reared in Senegal, Niger, India, Bangladesh for controlling uh, caterpillar pests. Hopefully it will be used against fall on your pretty shortly. Also in the Philippines, they are using a predator that is the earwig for controlling fall on your own. Next one, please. Well, fall armyworm eggs are covered by scales or hairs. You know, the egg mass is covered by that. It interferes with, uh, some, with the uh, efficacy of some of the parasites, especially trichogramma. Next one, please. Trichogramma species, some of them find it difficult to go through the scales and parasites. This work was done in Niger. As you see here in this slide, the Telomus remus was able to parasitize the eggs with the scales and without scales. But the trichogramma with the scale had difficulty in parasitizing. But when the scales were removed, the parasitism went up almost uh, double. Next one, please. Uh, this work was done in Kenya and Dr. Tadali Tefra was doing and they were releasing trichogramma Kylonis in the field and they were finding the egg reduction in egg masses and the reduction in larval uh, stages wherever you know, they release the egg parasites. Next one, please. Well, this slide shows the origin of the Telnomus remus. Telnomus remus was first found in Malaysia in 1935. And then Dr. V.P. Rao from India went to Papua New Guinea and picked it up and introduced to India in around 1965. From there, he shipped it to Israel and then to Caribbean countries. From the Caribbean countries, it was introduced into South America, then eventually to Florida. And now it has been found uh, occurring in different parts of Africa. Probably it migrated or moved from Israel into African countries. And also similarly, we are also finding this parasite in different South and Southeast Asian countries. I'm sure if, uh, if the surveys are conducted, uh, surveys were conducted in other countries, we will find this parasite occurring naturally over there. Next one, please. This slide simply shows the introduction of this parasite, Telnomus remus, from Papua New Guinea to different parts of the world. Okay, I won't go into reading this slide, but you can get it from the from Alison and her colleagues. Next one, please. Well, you can see here Telnomus remus. It is a very effective parasite. It is able to go through the egg masses of the Spot of Fujifred or the fall armyworm and parasite give good parasitism. And trichogramma, some species of trichogramma are more effective than the others, like trichogramma proteosum or wanjai are more effective than the other species. So some of this mass production of the parasites are go going on in Niger, Kenya, Tanzania, Nepal, Bangladesh, India, and also some lim limited field releases have been made in Kenya, Niger, Tanzania, and in India. And this work was started almost in, you know, in 2019, but since the uh, pandemic, coronavirus pandemic started early in 2020, this work has kind of got delayed in many of these countries. Next one, please. 
Okay, you can see here, field releasing telomeres remus from the laboratory culture, you can almost increase the parasitism up to 60% in the field. Without that, we get only about 10%. Next one, please. Similarly, in the, you know, we, some of the laboratories in, in India, they are working on the larval parasite. They found this Brocan brevicarnis attacking the fourth and fifth star larvae of the fall army worm. The egg parasites take care of the, you know, uh, the, the eggs of the fall army worm. The first and second in star usually stick gregarious and they stay on the leaves. And then the third, in, when the fall army worm reaches the third in star, it becomes cannibalistic and they will eat each other. Finally, you will find one big worm in the world that may be around in the fourth or fifth in star stage. So this Brocan brevicornis specializes in parasitizing fourth, fifth in star larvae of fall army worm and other caterpillars too. So it could, we could combine the egg and larval parasite in the field to get more effective uh, control of the fall army worm. Next one, please. Uh, this slide also shows about the releasing the uh, Brocan brevicornis in the field. We can increase the parasitism as well as control the larvae of fall army worm. Next one, please. Uh, this is Hebrobrocan habitat, or uh, Brocan habitat. It is it, currently it is used for controlling the permillet head miner in Niger. The, it is a polyphagous one. It will also attack the fall army worm. Next one, please. In Niger, what they do, they they rear this parasite in the laboratory using the rice mill moth caterpillars. And they have developed a technique. They produce small gunny sacks and that put about 200 grams of the grains, broken grains of maize, sorghum or wheat. And then they place about 20 to 25 caterpillar, rice millmoth caterpillars and also release two mated females of the hebrobrocan habitat inside these sacks. And then they, next one please. They will tie these sacks in the field. Here you can see they have, used a bucket to protect the sacks from the rain. Here they have used a, a shell of a goat to protect it. And sometimes they even tie it on the top of the granaries so that this parasite will be, will be coming out of the sack and parasitizing the caterpillars in the field uh, for about two weeks. And we also conducted uh, training sessions for on how to produce these, paras these parasites. We conducted one in Nairobi, Kenya, and another one in Niger. Next slide, please. And altogether, we had about 40 candidates from 20 different countries uh, trained in how to produce these parasites. Next one, please. Uh, what we are trying to do is in the IPM Innovation Lab, we try to you know, collect these parasites locally and then use a center for producing, producing these parasites in, in the laboratories. And then from there, we try to get, uh, you know, disperse the technique to the countries. So in the case of East Africa, we are trying in Ethiopia, Kenya, and Tanzania. And we also ask the countries to provide the laboratories and the technicians and our laboratory supplies to produce these things. Then we develop these nucleus laboratories in each country. And eventually we plan to set up satellite laboratories to produce that in different parts of the country and release this parasite. Next one, please. Same model we are trying to introduce into Nepal as well as Bangladesh here. IPM Innovation Lab works with the government laboratory in, this, in the capital city more, mostly and like Kathmandu in Nepal. And then from this nucleus center, we try to set up all these uh, satellite centers using cooperatives or some of the government institutions or the universities just to produce and help releasing these parasites. Next one, please. Uh, this Mooney, we just shows... got a bit of a time uh, issue. So well, if we can just speed up a little bit. Yes. Great, thank you. Okay. You know, augmentative research, biological control, we, you know, we are talking about this augmentative only in the biological control, even release of the chemical pesticide periodically come under the augmentative release. Next one, please. The one, 
Okay, this is the last slide here. I get kind of mention about the benefits of the augmented release of the biological control because here we help in developing the human and institutional capacity building in each country. So all the money that we spend in the producing these parasites and predators, they stay within the country. Unlike in the case of pesticides, most of the pesticides are bought from outside you know, the developing countries and most of the money goes out. But in this case, it stays within the country. That's all. Thank you very much, Alice. Excellent. Thank you very much, Mooney. And that was a great presentation with lots of information. And just remember, everyone, the slides will be shared uh, and you will have a copy of the recording as well. Remember, if you have questions, please put them in the Q&A box, not the chat box. Uh, if you do have any technical difficulties, please um, just write it in the chat box there and Pranav, our specialist, will help you out. We have some questions coming in now. We're going to have to do this quite fast, Mooney, because we've run out a bit of time. Of time. Um, um, but Mooney will be able to actually go into the Q&A box afterwards and provide written um, answers to your questions. Um, I've got a, quest a question here, Mooney. How cost effective is telonomus as compared to the use of trichogramma for fall armyworm? You know, the telonomus rearing has some problems in the sense it has been used in South America quite widely. And now we are attempting to use it in Asia. Telnomus rearing in the laboratory would be done using the fall armyworm eggs. But there are reports that so showing that it could be reared on the rice mill moth. So we are trying to standardize it. If we can rear it on the rice mill moth, it will be a lot cheaper. Trichogramma is always reared on the eggs of the uh, Corsera cephalonica or the rice mill moth. So the cost effectiveness of telnomis is a little bit more expensive than trichogramma, but we are trying to reduce that and hopefully we'll be able to standardize that technique shortly. Great, excellent, thank you. And I can see here I've made a mistake on the slide and I think it's from the old slide from last week with Roma, but we definitely are asking Mooney questions today. Uh, I have another question for you here. Um, from the Philippines, and it's something that I've also asked you uh, in relation to uh, running uh, potential technical workshops for the ASEAN um, Action Plan. But dear Dr. Mooney, do you have a plan to include the Philippines as a training venue for mass production of parasitoids? You know, my program doesn't operate in the Philippines because my program is funded by USAID. They are operated only to work in Vietnam, uh, Cambodia, Bangladesh, and Nepal within Asia. But right now we are communicating through webinars like this. So I can participate in webinars very easily because it doesn't involve uh, uh, much of expenses. Yeah. Excellent, thank you very much. And just for everyone out there, I've actually asked uh, in, in discussions with Dr. Mooney about how we can take advantage of his knowledge and the work being done in the Vietnam and Philippines and bring that to the rest of Southeast Asia. Um, another question, um, you mentioned your sort of model that you're using in Nepal. Is that, is that a model that you could use in other, uh, well, in Southeast Asian countries? Yes, definitely we can use that. You know, the same model first, first we developed in East Africa, in Kenya and Tanzania. Now we are trying to, you know, implement in Nepal. We had problem with because of the coronavirus, we were not able to move fast this year. And eventually we plan to come to Bangladesh. And in fact, we are also working in Cambodia uh, with Rika on that. Excellent. So there's a question about whether for telnomas only affect fall armyworm eggs or other armyworm. Actually, it attacks uh, other uh, armyworms like Sportoptera mauritia, Sportoptera exigua, Sportoptera litura. So it could be used for controlling other caterpillar pests. Excellent, Great. That's that's Italian just answered another question. <laughs> you yeah. must have <laughs> been reading my mind. Um, I have another question here from Ravi Joshi in, in Philippines. Hi, Ravi. Um, dear Dr. Mooney, why some species of trichogramma are more effective than other trichogramma species on fall armyworm? Is it related to the length of the OV positive? Uh, you know, it's hard to say well, what exactly is the case. Like there are some species are specialized, some species of trichogramma specialized on the eggs of some uh, lepidopteran uh, species. For example, in the case of rice stem borer, 
trichogramma, Japanicum is more effective than other trichogramma. In the case of diamond back moth, trichogramma, trichogramma bacteria is more effective than others. So we have to select which species of trichogramma is more uh, effective on these species, like trichogramma proteosum in South America, as well as in India, they are finding it to be more effective on Paul armyworm. In Tanzania, we found this trichogramma wanjai also so very effective on the trichogramma, sorry, on the Paul armyworm. Excellent. Well, thank you very much, Mooney. Um, there are some questions there for you. If you could answer them in writing on the Q&A and then everyone will see the answers uh, as well, that would be most appreciated. Just go into the Q&A box and you'll see quite a few there for you. Um, thank you so much for that presentation. Uh, we really appreciate you getting up in the morning and I think uh, it's 4.30 in the morning or something terrible like that where you are based uh, in Virginia in, in the US. So thank you so much. Uh, and uh, we'll hopefully, uh, you'll keep joining us through the length of the webinar. Okay, thank, thank you. you. Thank, thank you very you, much. Bye. Excellent. I'd now like to introduce our next speaker, Dr. Ted Turlings, who is a professor at the University of Neuchâtel in Switzerland, and currently he's head of the Laboratory of Fundamental and Applied Research in Chemical Ecology, which focuses on the use of plant-produced signals to improve crop protection. Uh, in addition, he's also the director of the newly established Center of Competence in Chemical Ecology at the University of Neuchâtel. And Ted, can you hear me and join us and welcome? Yes, I hear you well. Thank you for that uh, very kind introduction and uh, greetings from Switzerland. Uh, <clears throat> I will be talking about um, how we, our efforts to use nematodes against uh, fall arm worm. And this is a collaboration between the University of Neuchâtel Gabi and the Rwandan Agricultural Board. So the field trial that I'll talk you, to you about was done in, in Rwanda. Next slide. Uh, and we'll see here the two players in this. They're both the brains and the muscle behind the research that, uh, that was conducted. Stefan Tupfer from Kabi and Patrick Fallet from the University of Neuchâtel, a PhD student who is also in the audience and who can answer some of your questions probably better than I can. Next slide. Uh, no need to explain to this audience that uh, fall armworm has become an extremely important problem in, in Africa, and that's why we do our field trials for the moment, but I hope to extend that also to Asia. Next slide, in Africa, estimates from mainly Kabi showing tremendous uh, impacts on the production of maize and probably losses of up to $5 billion US dollars per year. Nematodes uh, have a potential as biocontrol agents against many insects. They're usually considered against root pests below ground. But the observations that we made, and you can see that in the next slide, uh, when we started looking at using this nematodes, next, Alison, uh, uh, we, our first efforts were actually to try to use nematodes against the Western corn rootworm, next, where we have not just the beetle being a problem, but mainly the larvae that feed on the roots. And we uh, were considering to use nematodes in beads, as you will see in the next slide now. We were able to put nematodes in small alginate beads of about half a centimeter in diameter, up to 5,000 nematodes that we put to sleep by adding a certain chemical to it. And when we add water, they wake up and they are able to uh, infect those larvae in the soil. So we were considering this to use this as something that can be planted in the soil together with the seeds and then against the, the larvae. But we also were considering to add um, feeding stimulants and attractants to it. And while we were playing with that in the lab, as you will see in the next little movie, we were trying this without realizing how important fall armworm would be coming. If you can see if you can get the video started, yeah. So here you see the small little beads. We add some coloring to it, so they're blue. Here the nematodes are moving, but we can put them to sleep. And we were just playing with it, adding leaf extract to the beads, and we got fall armworm larvae that we were also working on at the time, feeding on it. And if there are nematodes in those beads, Within a day or two, the larvae will look like this, completely dead. 
and they become then the uh, source of a new generation of nematodes that eventually will burst out and can also kill the next generation of the pest. So that's what this video is showing. So this was already done before we started working on uh, nematodes against fall armworm. So that had great promise and we got pretty excited about possible prospects of applying this in the field in Africa. Here you see Patrick with many curious people uh, looking at what crazy things this Swiss guy is doing there. We were then decided to not use nematodes that we have in Switzerland, but actually go to Africa to see if there are any nematodes in the soil there and that we can then apply effectively against fall armworm because we don't want to introduce new species or even new genotypes of the same species that may be occurring there. We want to use local nematodes. And if we get the opportunity to do that in Asia as well, we'll do the same thing. Look for local nematodes against fall armworm. Next, so initially, next slide. Initially, uh, Patrick then designed a number of uh, laboratory experiments within these cages he had uh, mace plants with fall armworm on them and then applied different treatments, including the beet, uh, beet treatments, but uh, eventually we switched to gel treatments that's easier to apply. So the same uh, material, alginate, but then as a gel applied to the center of the plants. Next slide. And then look at larvae that were on these plants and see how they survived. So here are the different types of treatments that he applied, just water, nothing in it, oil and gel without nematodes. And then to the right of each of these two bar graphs, you see uh, these uh, formulations with nematodes. And you see that there's, in terms of caterpillar survival, the gel application with the nematodes was the most effective, killing 100% of the larvae that he applied in these cage situations. So this is not the field yet, huh? And then uh, in terms of damage to the plants, you see that that's also very significantly reduced by applying these nematodes. I should mention that the oil application is a commercially available formulation that we used as a comparison to our gel. And you see that we're at least as good the gel. Next slide. So then he went to Africa with Stefan and collaborated with the people from RAB at, in Rwanda. They selected four different fields to do this experiments. I'm gonna show you the average for over all the fields. I, Patrick emphasized to me still yesterday to mention that these fields were very heavily infested by fallen worm throughout the season uh, and therefore were ideal to test this. Here's Patrick putting the gel together uh, in collaboration with the people there, including the nematodes. Next slide. Uh, this gel was then placed in these glue guns uh, that can easily, relatively easily, squirt this gel into the center of the, of the plants, as you will see in the next slide. In these, so here you see how the application is done. And the, at the same time, other plants were treated with different uh, treatments like the ones I showed you before, water with nematodes or oil with nematodes, as well as pesticide that he used as a extreme control measure. Next, so here we'll see a few slides with the people applying here the gel, selected plants that were treated with the gel and nematodes and others were treated differently. Next slide, again, you see that that is a real team effort Next, Alison. And here you see one of the successes. So Patrick smiling there because there were dead larvae, as you see there, and they definitely looked like they were infected by nematodes. Next slide. And that was confirmed. So here's the same picture with these cl a close up of the larvae that were dead. Uh, and when they took those to the lab, eventually it's not a very good picture. The nematodes burst out. So they were definitely killed by the nematodes under the lab, under the field conditions. Next. They then, in all of the different treatments that were used, they were used after five uh, days, a certain number of plants were inspected for larval presence and 10 days, another group of plants looking for the numbers of larvae that were present. They also looked at damage, but I won't show you the, those results today. 
And here is then the most critical slide of them all with the raw results for after five days using the control that was not treated with anything as the baseline. So the numbers of caterpillars found there and then the reduction in the percentage of caterpillars on the other treatments. And you see the pesticide and the gel were about the same. Actually, the gel is slightly better after five days a, few, uh, a reduction in 40% of the larvae. Let me remind you that it was very heavily infested here because 40% may not be so impressive, but the pesticide didn't do any better and they used a very high dose of pesticide. So better than the pesticide almost, and that was also uh, at least as good as the pesticide statistically after 10 days. Oil, a commercial oil with nematodes and water with nematodes were not as effective. So that brings me almost to the end already of, the, of this presentation to show you that this can be used in the field. This is what would happen if you don't treat the plants with any, anything. The larvae will eventually completely destroy the center of the plant. And in the next slide, you'll see that this is what you end up actually when you have gel treatments. The caterpillars will get the, uh, killed be long before they do that kind of damage. You see the old leaves have larval damage, but the center of the plant has survived this very nicely and the plant can grow as it wishes and develop completely. A few simple conclusions. The nematodes have great potential to serve as a biological control agents and fall armorworm. We recommend that uh, we use weekly applications. This was only once but the larvae uh, certainly in, under those very heavy infestation conditions, uh, uh, circumstances will come back, also move from other plants in there. That was probably the explanation why we didn't see better results. The formulation can be further improved by adding attractants and feeding stimulants. And we will want to focus next also on making this as simple as possible because we want to do this, use this technology for subs subsistence farmers and that also applies for possible application in Africa. My last slide is to then thank again the people that did the actual work. So Stefan and Patrick together with the staff of RAB who did all this and they will continue to do this to make it work even better than it already does. I thank them. One more click. Uh, uh, and thank you for your attention. I will be happy to answer questions. Great. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ted. Um, can you hear me? Yes, yes, I do. Oh, great. Excellent. So sorry. Um, look, that was a fantastic presentation. Um, great photos. And I, I really liked the video. It worked a bit faster for me than I think it did for you. And um, perfect. Um, and, and I quite like this idea of putting the nematodes to sleep. Uh, it was nice that you could wake them up again. <laughs> I thought, but look, um, do you think there are local nematodes in Southeast Asia that, that such that a similar project could be um, developed? Yeah, there must be plenty of uh, species present there. And the, the species uh, that we are working with are considered to be globally present. Um, there's still some discussion about the taxonomy. So whatever defines as a species, uh, species is, is a little bit up in the air still. So we would like to get even if it's is is the same species as we may have in Europe, I would like to get the one from Southeast Asia if we were to apply it there, uh, in order not to introduce any different genotypes that that are not natively present. But Thank definitely, you. we will find nematodes that could be effective against fallen worm also in Asia. Great, thank you. Uh, here's a question: Has weather or does weather have any effect on EPN if efficacy on fall armyworm? So, does the weather play a role? Yes, they well, they are definitely sensitive to UV light, and, and uh, drought will be a problem under the conditions that they were applied in Rwanda. It was uh, during the rainy season, so there was quite a bit of water, uh, and that is. And in a way is good. That also will, in the case we put them to sleep, that will wake them up because the compound will be diluted. That puts them to sleep. But yes, uh, in this gel, we also plan to put some uh, sunscreen, if you wish, to protect them better against the UV light. By, but already placing them in the world of the maize plants will only 
protect them to against UV. And as as you see from the results, they did manage to survive and, and kill these these okay. larvae. And they survived for several days. But the weather conditions will have an effect. Yes. Okay, just looking at, I know that you, you took some time in thinking about how to apply these nematodes with the, the gun, which looked uh, very easy and, and quite simple, but innovative. For large scale application of gel based application, is that, is that viable, do you think? Uh, it depends on what kind of farmer you're talking about, but uh, the, the farmers that we're working with right now, I think for them it would be very uh, easy to do it the way we do it. So they have relatively small farms. Uh, they already are willing to go out in the field and kill the larvae by hand. So it's a lot less work to apply the, the, the gel. We're still working on uh, different types of formulations that are easier to apply. And also with larger squirt guns that, that we can apply. But it's, if it's a weekly application as we have foreseen now, just manually by the, the local farmers. I think this is definitely something that would be. And so economically, does it, have you done some economic analysis comparing it to other methods? No, we haven't done exact uh, analysis, but I would say that, that rearing the nematodes uh, would be at least as cheap as say the mass rearing of, uh, of trachogrammas uh, and would be uh, less effort. Uh, I could imagine that we would have small startup family uh, companies that, that we could teach to do this. Uh, we're far from that. Huh? So I'm, I'm giving a very optimistic scenario, but what I, what I think nematodes are, if, uh, if we develop the right technology uh, locally, uh, are relatively cheap to produce. The, the, the alginate is not, nothing expensive and we could probably make that even cheaper. So I, I'm, quite optimistic that in terms of biocontrol, this would be one of the cheapest solutions to use. Excellent. And just one question, those, how do are those guns, the, the, how good, I mean, are they, they're obviously quite simple to use and anyone can use them in the field. Did the farmers, did you get some feedback from farmers on how they perceived the use of nematodes and, and how they perceived the, the method that you've developed? I think uh, we'll probably let Patrick answer that in the chat because uh, I'm not, uh, I think they must have talked to some farmers, but it was mostly the local researchers that they work with. Um, so I cannot give you the real answer to that. What I, um, what I understand of the difficulty is actually to get the gel into the squirt gun is a bit of a messy work. So we're now looking at a different kind of formulation that is easier to introduce into, into okay. the and. Um, I've got one more question that's sort of related actually to what I've just asked, but it's in the same question. In which instar level is the gel and nematodes the most effective? Is that something you can answer? Uh, yeah, we, there were laboratory studies and uh, also done here with, by Patrick and, and that master student. As far as I remember, all the larval instars get killed. Okay. Them. And one more question, because we have to move on to our next speaker, but we've got lots there. So you and Patrick are going to be busy, Ted. Um, do these nematodes have a positive symbiosis in case of roots or, or negative symbiosis? Uh, a symbiosis with the roots? Is that the question? I think so. Okay. Uh, so they will, the, these nematodes do not attack the plants. Huh? So they, so these are definitely different from uh, 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 photophagous uh, nematodes. Uh, and what we actually have, and this is coincidental, but what we have discovered is actually when in, the, in their presence, the roots uh, will respond uh, molecularly and actually the plants will defend themselves more strongly and induces some more resistance in the plant. A completely different topic, but it's definitely a, an interesting additional benefit that we think we will have by well, well that certainly is an interesting um additional benefit and that's probably a good place to leave it for now there's lots of questions coming in for you and patrick so so feel free to um to get on the q a and answer some of those and thank you very much Ted, for joining us and thank you for patrick too and and some great photos of seeing you out there in the field to it that's very nice to see so thank you very much ted patrick thank you
And you can turn your video off now, uh, Ted, and I'd like to introduce Dr. Zhenying Wang from the Institute of Plant Protection uh, in the Chinese Academy of Agricultural Sciences. And he has worked on IPM of corn insects uh, for more than 30 years, and his work has involved uh, IPM of fall armyworm since 2019 when it uh, invaded China. Uh, he is also a member of the FAO Global Action Fall Armyworm Technical Committee. Uh, so welcome. Thank you for kind introduction. Uh, I'm introduced mainly as a biological control. Yeah, you know, the four arm just arrived in China last year. So first, we survey and identification of natural enemies of four arm in China. And also, we did a lot of method learning and also some experiment release for four arm control. Please, next. We already, yeah, next, please. We already found two egg mass egg peptoids. It's also uh, like um, Dr. Mini mentioned, trigger, uh, the telenomous remus and the trigorama kilonis. These two species is a, had a natural, uh, the high natural paradoxism rate. Next, please. And also we found five larval peptoids. Uh, this one, uh, uh, macropolitis and also Cortesia, next please. And also another three, and also is uh, Melchorosimilis and uh, Eclococcus, and also the Diagramma. So these five uh, love paratoids we already found in south part of China. Next please. We also found one pupil paratoid and also one egg level paratoid. Next, please. In the field, we found many predatory bugs. We found four kind of the bugs, like the Amia trinicesis and also Pagromerus levisi. These two species, with uh, in my to some uh, professor did the uh, function response in the laboratory. The nephews and also the adult, they can predict a lot of the larvae or for ammon per daily. Per, uh, daily. Next, please. And also another two uh, predatory bugs. We also we found, often found in the field and also they can predict a lot of the larvae or the for ammon uh, when they did the experiment in the, in the laboratory. Next, please. And also, we found a lot of the lead blood beetles and also the less wings in the field. They can predict uh, the egg masses of the forearm moon and also the larvae or different in that of the forearm moon in the field. Next, please. We also found one predatory Carambid beetle, the dart and the, the larvae also can predict the four arm larvae in the field. Next, please. We also found one ear wig. The adult and also nephew, they can predict the larvae of the four arm in the field and it's very effectively. Next, please. Uh, you know, for the uh, trigorama mass rearing is a long history in China. So we have the, did some the rearing techniques very successfully. Next, please. We rear the trigorama in China. We use two methods. It's a small egg masses, a, small eggs for some species of trigorama. And also we use a Chinese oak silk worm for other several species. Because the trigorama uh, kilonis, the, it can be read on the rest mouse eggs. So this is the measuring for the trigorama of the kilonis and also other species. So this is the measuring for the rest mouse larvae. And this collect the rest mouse adult then this the machine for collect the eggs 
of the rest moss and also they clean the flat head because they have some skill on it. Then make the air cut, then really introduce the tree grama. It's uh, prepare the paratoid egg heart. Next, please. And also, we use the true the citrog eggs for measuring the true grammar. Uh, this uh, method is introduced from the Europe, but developed in China. So this is uh, a production line for measuring all the citrog eggs. So this uh, rearing the citrog eggs, this uh, uh, collection of the moss, then collect the eggs of citrog, then for trigger material. Next, please. And also, in the laboratory, we select the candidates for the for rearing the telenomous remus. We found the Cisbotera laterum. Let, Latura, the egg mass is very good candidates for re mass rearing of the telonomous in the laboratory. Next, please. And also a pilot production for the predatory bugs very successfully in the laboratory by using artificial diet. This one is species Amera trinicesis. This one is already mass produced, it's partly used for the cash crop, like the tobacco to control the, some of the late pattern insects. Next, please. And also a pallet production, another predatory bugs, and in, in large scale, and also they have products when released in the field. Next, please. Next, please. Yeah, the field release for the four ammon control. Next, please. A pilot uh, release to control the four arm four ammon by release the telomeres remus. We release the paratoids and also we re also uh, hang some the uh, the four arm eggs is a laboratory produced, then release the paratoids after three days later, we collect, we take back all the, egg, the four arm eggs, then check the paratoids reads of the four arm eggs. We found the telenomous rumors has very good control effects on the four arm eggs. So for the egg masses, is a, the paratoid rate is 100%. For the eggs, is over 80% of the egg eggs is paratized by the telenomous. Next, please. Trigorama kilonis is also released to control the four arm in the field. After release, we found the parasitization rate for the egg masses and the eggs of the four arm worm is 70%, 70, over 70% and 80% respectively. Next, please. And also, we, uh, in some laboratory, they some the uh, experiment to release the predatory bugs. So when they release the different ratio of the uh, predatory bugs, this species, Sankasa and tarotus, when at the different ratio, one to 20 and 12 to 110, they found after two weeks, the release uh, for um, larvae is predated by the predatory bugs. So the, compared with the pesticides, 
when the 115 ratio 100 release the forearm larvae is predicted by the predatory bugs. Next, please. And also, they release another predatory bugs, armor kinesis. They release the adult or nephews and they found when at the density of 450 adult per hectare after 70 liter, nearly 76% uh, of the control effect achieved when released the density of 600 nephew per hectare, 70 lead. So they got very good control effects. And also some of the experiment release did by releasing another predatory bugs. They release the oris for the forearm control. When they release, release at at the density of 20 for a plant, corn plant, the control effects are over 30% in the kid test. So this is a, the result. So because only one year the experiment on the forearm release for the biological control, so that's the mainly result by the natural enemies for form control in China. Next, please. Oh, this is a thanks for some professor provide, provide some of the data and the photos. Next, thank you for attendance. Thank you so much. Uh, that was incredibly interesting and um, I'm just uh, struck by the amount of examples that you had there and, and how many possible candidates for natural yes. enemies that you actually identified. Um, it seems a very extensive program. Just, um, I guess, one question would be uh, here is how, um, how economic, like, is this a, 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 an economically feasible uh, approach for, do you think, for countries to be um, investing in and for farmers to be using? Yeah, for the, you know, for the trigorama in China, we use it for the control of the Asian combo for many years. So this uh, is partly when released the trigorama use the uh, big hook, uh, the uh, Chinese oak seed worm eggs is very, very cheap per hectare, I think uh, it's around uh, per hectare around uh, three or three to five dollars. But if you use the small eggs like the rice moss egg or seed hog eggs, it's a little uh, more, it, uh, it's a little more expensive compared to the oak, kind of oak worm eggs. But it's also one hectare uh, for one release is around uh, uh, for, uh, 50, yes, yeah, $50. But because the, uh, the technique is very mature in China because uh, the different kind of egg cut and also even now we, use, we release the triple round by the drone. So uh, I think for the Trigorama release for control the four amum in the south part for the over winter, uh, for the year round uh, occurrence areas for consecutive consecutively release we it will keep the four amum at the low density. I think it's uh, excellent. And you you use drone to to release it. That's, yes. Yes. No. That's interesting. Yeah. Um, a question here from uh, Ravinder Joshi, again, uh, good to see your questions coming in. Uh, a lot of interest here. Have you encountered any hyperparasitoids during natural enemy surveys? Pardon? 
Have you encountered any hyperparasitoids during natural oh, enemy yeah. surveys? Uh, uh, one uh, doctor already found uh, in Guido province, we, they found three hyperparatoids uh, wasp already, three species. Ah, excellent, thank you. Um, a question here, um, it says, well, it's, it also says, thank you for the many um, examples you provided. Um, can we use the earwigs that are commonly found in banana uh, in controlling armyworm? Is there a specific type of earwig that works better, or <laughs> do you think any earwig, any earwig uh, offers uh, some opportunity uh, here? <laughs> earwig, yeah, earwig is, uh, I think at first we can uh, protect, uh, protect in, uh, it. Uh, if we uh, plant the corn in the cropping with other crops, mm -hmm. uh, provides the uh, higher uh, the, the different uh, biodiversity, this one uh, can protect it. And also in China, in some laboratories, they began rearing the yevua and the release, and also have some re result release in the field to control the farm worm already. Okay. In China, yeah. Dr. Wang, which is the most or the more effective fall armyworm predator, the pentatimid or the reduvid one? Ah, uh, the, <laughs> the predators, yeah, because mainly they found it's very effective in the field. So the many predators now in laboratory, they use the they use, uh, function response to that. And the uh, Amara, Amara uh, uh, predator um, bugs, these, these are the adults, when they, they can predict the third in uh, third uh, in star larvae, they can over 60. So they release it in the small scale field, they, they have very good control effect. Excellent, thank you for that answer. Um, I have another question here, uh, and then we may um, uh, allow you to answer some of those questions in writing, because there's quite a few coming through. Uh, question here, on which host do you rear Arma chinensis, or chinensis, oh. as a predator? At first, they use some of the, like the very easy red host, like the uh, the oriental army worm because it can easily mesurium. But now in China, they already uh, developed one artificial diet uses the, some of the uh, insect ingredients like the oak silkworm worm eggs, a uh, silk worm uh, moss, uh, pupae. Uh, but little, still a little bit uh, expensive, but not. Uh, if um, they begin, they are want to reduce the cost for measuring that. Yeah, excellent. Thank you so much, Dr. Wang. I, I would just have to say that there's so much information that we would like to uh, ask you, and we'll definitely um, w welcome you back and all the okay. other speakers today. Uh, it would be great to work uh, more closely because obviously there's a lot of work uh, that all of you are undertaking. And in China, there seems to be a particularly um, huge efforts uh, going into uh, managing fall armyworms. So it's great to see. And thank you for sharing that with us today. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Wang. Yeah. And if you could answer any questions okay. on the Q&A box, that would be most, uh, we would be most grateful. Thank okay. you very yeah. much. Thank you. I'd now like to introduce our last speaker today, uh, Chris Waikas, and I'm not sure I did pronounce that, and I promised I would try much better this time. Chris, um, if you can turn on your video, or you can keep your video off, actually, and we'll just turn it off in the Q&A if that's better. Um, Chris is a Belgian bioscience engineer and insect ecologist, and Chris lives in Vietnam and works as an independent consultant and is very experienced in devising and validating nature-based solutions to pest control in both temperate and tropical settings. It's a pleasure to welcome you, Chris. Chris uh, has guided me through with lots of advice uh, and expertise uh, over over the last six months and it's truly a pleasure to have you uh, as the last speaker of this biocontrol uh, webinar series. Chris. Yep, thank you Alison. 
Um, thank you for the, the, the invitation and, and the introduction. So I have a, a short, a broad picture uh, presentation. So not really a, a technical presentation, but more a broad, a broad picture uh, presentation. And I will start with a, with a color. I start with the color green, my favorite color. Uh, next slide, please. So green is the color of the world when we observe it from space. A admittedly, the oceans are blue, but most of the terrestrial uh, landmass is green. Uh, next slide. Um, and, the, and the world is green because the action of herbivores, such as this uh, colorful uh, caterpillar here, is kept at bay. Uh, herbivore action is kept in check by a whole range of organisms. Next slide, please. Uh, be belonging to different life forms and animal taxa. These formidable allies are indeed the little things that run the world, as E.O. Wilson uh, uh, says, and their pest control action is worth billions of dollars. Uh, uh, next slide. Yeah. Uh, evidently, these so-called natural enemies should be farmers' friends. They work 24-7, night, night and day, rain and shine, without drawing any salary. What conservation biological control really pursues is to conserve farmers' friends, is to protect them from harm, to sustain their field populations, and to boost their biological control services. Two golden principles and one truth underpin conservation biological control. Next slide. Yeah. Principle number one, what one kills, one cannot protect. Principle number two, what one protect, one shouldn't kill. And truth number one is Dead bugs do not provide pest control. So these two principles and this one truth, they really uh, embody what biological control, what conservation biological control is all about. That we have to conserve, we have to protect farmers' friends, we have to protect those uh, six-footed allies of, of, uh, of farmers across the globe. Next slide. So I may have been stating the obvious with those two principles and one truth. These golden principles are not well understood, nor, nor by farmers, nor by government decision makers. Indeed, the dominant form of crop protection across the globe involves the repeated use of pesticides in farmers' fields. And the golden principles of biological control are violated every single day, be it one, through the preventative use of systemic insecticides at the time of planting, be it through insecticide coated seeds and pesticide dips, two, by blanket ap applications of synthetic pesticides, including with drones, and three, by, by the use of broad, spe broad, broad spectrum products which kill pests and natural enemies alike. Next slide. Yeah. Instead, what one should pursue is IPM. IPM or Integrated Pest Management. IPM entails the tactical integration and deliberate prioritization of pest management practices in which preventative approaches such as biological control really constitute the first line of defense. They, they make up the bottom uh, of, of the IPM pyramid. And then curative measures, especially the use of, of synthetic pesticides, they are a measure of last resort, yeah? used wisely, sparingly, and in a targeted fashion. Always keeping in mind that pesticides are toxins, products meant to kill. Next slide. Cutting pesticide use is thus essential in order to effectively promote biological control and especially conservation bio biological control. Though I hear 
people in the audience already whisper that cutting pesticide use is impossible. Such was entirely feasible 25 years ago. Through the UN-backed Farmer Field School program, millions of farmers across Southeast Asia, across the entire uh, Asia Pacific region, were trained on biological control, were trained on non-chemical pro crop protection, and pesticide use as a result was cut by up to 82% in rice, by up to 50 to 70% in tea and cabbage, and from 1992 to 1997, when I was still a teenager, training programs decreased insecticide use by 50% without any loss of crop yield on 2 million rice farms throughout the Mekong Delta. By doing so, biological control was given a chance. Next slide. Yeah. Now, specifically for fall armyworm, there is a long lineup of natural enemies. As we already heard in the previous talks by Ted, by uh, Zheng Ying, uh, by Muni, ants, earwigs, entomopathogenic nematodes and parasitic wasps all act against Spodoptera frugiperda. Yeah? Hitting Falarmi worm heart across its invaded range as well as in its native range. Yeah? Uh, causing parasitism levels regularly up to 90% and, and, and resulting in, in a, a pupil predation, often up to 90% or higher as well. Next slide. Yeah. So now those natural enemies, there are different ways to encourage those natural enemies in a farmer's field. Yeah. A first approach is by providing shelter for farmers' allies. Shelter can be provided through the establishment of beetle banks, which are small strips of unplowed land in the center of cropping fields where natural enemies such as uh, ground beetles or parasitic wasps can take shelter. Next, mulching uh, uh, can, can be done of farmer fields. Uh, next one, next, zero uh, and, and conservation tillage, next. Uh, the establishment of inter or cover crops with beans, with mung bean, with soybean, with groundnut. Um, next, by the deployment of bird boxes or bird perches. Next. And then for natural enemies that work the night shift, Cambodian rice farmers have devised ingenious contraptions to shelter their populations from harm. So bat, bats, uh, during the daytime, they can roost in, in, in these structures that are built by Cambodian uh, rice farmers. Next. Nectar and pollen are the high octane fuel for many of these natural enemies. Farmers can provide these vital food, food sources by establishing uh, uh, flower strips at the field border or by making occasional applications of sugar water sprays, as has been tested extensively in Central America, as well as in, in parts of, of Africa. Yeah. For millennia, Vietnamese and Chinese mango and citrus growers have benefited from the pest control action of the weaver ant Oikophila smaragdina. They sustain ant populations in their or orchard by feeding them with kitchen scraps and chicken bones. On the other hand, Indonesian rice growers add organic matter to their fields, uh, which enhances the population of plankton uh, feeders and detritivores such as Deseret chironomid larva, and thereby they support biological control. Both of these groups of farmers routinely do not need any pesticides for uh, uh, pest control, yeah? Now, does it really make a difference? Of course it does. Nicaraguan cabbage growers who ref refrain from pesticide use and who employ conservation biological control earn a staggering $2,200 more than conventional growers. In Benin, 
cotton growers that rely upon biological control pocket more than $250 more per hectare than conventional farmers. And in Indonesia, cacao growers uh, that actively protect insect killing birds and bats earn $730 per hectare. Um, oh, Oh, yeah. in, in, all these, in all these systems, farmer income soars, the rural economy thrives, and nature benefits. And in the end, isn't that what we all pursue? Thank you very much, Chris. Um, that was a, a, a very, um, I was going to say, picturesque. Uh, but serious at the same time uh, presentation. So thank you very much for that and for all the examples uh, as well. Um, I'm just going to check the questions um, that are coming through. So I'm sure there's lots uh, as well. Um, I've got a question for you um, here and it is how easy is it to um, maintain these, this type of approach in the face of a rapidly changing conditions, for example? So is it easy to do this for farmers when you have a huge infestation of fall armyworm coming your way? Oh, I think it's, it's, it, 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 it's easy. If, if, you, if you reduce the, the dependency on, on pesticides and, and you build in diversity in the system, uh, you respect uh, soil health, uh, for, it, for example, uh, you maintain natural elements in, in the agricultural landscape, you give biological control all possible chances to act against fall army worm. And, and maybe it, it, the, 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 the level of, of, uh, of, of biological control will be low in year one, but steadily it will build up. As long as you re remove uh, the, the unnecessary disturbances in, 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 in the system, and you make sure that shelter, alternative host and prey items, pollen and, and, and nectar and, and uh, diversity are provided, I, I, I think it will work in, in the end. And how long does it take for the yield to, to be the same or more? I mean, you, you gave some examples where yield was higher, but when you're starting out on um, this approach, perhaps, uh, or changing from another approach. How long does it take until your yields uh, increase? And, and I'm just thinking of smallholder farmers that don't always have a lot of um, cash at hand uh, to invest or to change uh, farming practices. How long does it take, do you think, before they can see the return on their investment? Yeah. I, I, I think it all depends on, on the farmer con context. If, if you are in a hev heavily intensified uh, uh, far farming setting in, in which uh, uh, soil health is very, 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 very low, in which you've, you've been uh, using um, uh, pesticides and, and, uh, and, and chemical fertilizer uh, for uh, decades, uh, it'll, it'll take time for diversity to increase and it'll take time for biological control services to be back up, 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 to, up to normal or optimum uh, levels. So that, that make time, may, may take time, but if you're a, a smallholder farmer uh, cultivating half, half a hectare in a very diverse uh, in, in environment uh, uh, with the field surrounded by a, a range of different habitats, including crop and non-crop habitats, or oh, maybe it, maybe after after less than one one year, your yields will be, uh, yeah, ju just the same as as a, as in a setting in which you you would use uh, other uh, um, uh, chemically derived approaches. Okay, um, I have a question here. Um, any effort to implement uh, your hypothesis or this approach to manage fall armyworm? I mean, are there examples of this for fall armyworm in Southeast Asia now? In Southeast Asia now, uh, con conservation biological control. I, yes. I imagine in different countries, uh, certain aspects of conservation biological control are being te tested. Agroecological techniques such as intercropping, cover cropping, I am sure that is being tested in different uh, Southeast Asian countries. Um, yeah. uh, 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 
approaches such as beetle banks, flower strips. Uh, I, I think that is being evaluated in, in, in China and maybe in, in some other uh, countries as well. Um, okay. Yeah. Um, here is a question here. I have use of insecticides is obviously a disturbance that adversely affects natural enemies. The challenge is, however, how do you convince farmers not to make unnecessary insecticide applications? Yeah, I think that's, that's, that's really the challenge. Uh, uh, we have some, some pub publications uh, um, over the past two, two years that have, have shown globally uh, how farmers are basically unaware of, of all those allies that they have in the field. They don't know the natural enemies, uh, they don't believe in biological control, uh, and, and, uh, and they, yeah, uh, they do believe in, in, in pesticide-based ap ap approaches. So, the bottom line here is really to to train farmers to to raise farmer awareness about about those natural natural enemies uh, about ways to to pro to protect them and uh, and about uh, how to steer clear of pesticide use because for many farmers the use of pesticides is 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 it is an inch is insurance basically it's a risk averse approach uh, and and uh, the 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 more they apply pesticides the the more they think they safeguard their their yield from eventual upsets and 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 disturbances such as uh, um, uh, fall army worm pest outbreak. Okay, on the top of that pyramid, I mean, you did see um, in that IPM pyramid there was um, the efficacious use of pesticides. When 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 is that? When do you think people can use that? I mean, when does that come into play? Oh, that's so that it's so the use of 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 synthetic pesticides is is a is is really a measure of of last resort when nothing else works. Uh, then 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 a, a a farmer can can uh, can take the pesticide bottle and 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 spray his or her 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 field. Uh, but there's uh, many other other approaches that should be given pr priority. Um, when does, does a farmer uh, need to apply pesticides? Well, there are decision criteria under, under IPM, such as an economic threshold or economic injury, injury level and an, and an action threshold. So there are certain infestation levels in which, under which uh, um, the use of, of, of synthetic pesticides is economically justified. Okay. Uh, in in a thirty to forty day old uh, uh, corn fields, this could be at an infestation level of uh, twenty to thirty larvae per hundred plants. Uh, okay. So the, 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 these infestation levels, they they are not zero, uh, but they are not exceptionally high either. Okay, Chris, I've just got one other question here as well, which I want to ask you because we have to we have to draw a close. If you could answer this very quickly, what other predators observed when using uh, leguminous crops as shelter in the field? Thank you. Uh, say it again. What other, what other predators have you observed when using uh, leguminous uh, crops as shelter in the field? Oh, the the yeah the. The, the ones that occur within within a system, several several of those will increase in abundance in a diversified farm in a diversified maize field. Uh, so this could be an increase in abundance of ants. It could be an increase in abundance of of, uh, of ground beetles. It could also be of pa parasitic wasps because many uh, leguminous crops they provide extra floral nectar and and floral nectar uh, to foraging parasitoids. So many of the, the, the good insects, many of the natural enemies will increase in abundance and will increase in pest control uh, action against palarmi worm as well. Uh, it, is, it is not just one, it is several. Great, well, thank you very much. And um, there's a few questions for you to answer as well. If you could just jump on the Q&A while we close, that would be, that would be appreciated. I'll, I'll give you a little bit of time, hopefully, to answer those. Um, there's a, another good, a good couple of questions that have just come up, Chris. So thank you so much for your presentation. It was a pleasure to have you uh, in the session. And I'd now like to introduce Dr. Rika Floor from IRI, just to give a few uh, comments, summary comments. We may just finish two minutes late, uh, everyone. So I hope you can stay with us. Uh, Rika? 
Yes, uh, Alison, thank you so much. And I um, just so uh, tremendous uh, knowledge that was uh, provided by the speakers today, uh, really the experts in the field have shown us a wide range of uh, biological control options for fall armyworm that in each country, there is not uh, a lack of these uh, from egg parasitoids, larval parasitoids. Uh, we've heard about um, insect uh, killing uh, nematodes. There are many types of predators, uh, even hyperparasitoids hyper that are out there. And we've also been taken through uh, how these are mass reared uh, kind of diets that are being prepared and how these are released um, in, in, into the farms. Indeed, uh, there's a, a bit of, of discussion also on how to make these kind of systems work for, for um, getting biological control out to the farmers, uh, the type of institutional arrangements that are necessary to uh, bring this, whether it is about smallholder farmers uh, working on their own or whether it is about a system of, of um, institutions and laboratories um, bringing out uh, biological control and releasing it, uh, providing mass release for the farmers. So these are kind of uh, different uh, ways in which uh, institutionally uh, biological control and, and release can be done for the farmers. Uh, Chris also uh, brought it back towards um, the importance of conservation and how uh, these types of, of biological control, they exist a lot, they, they provide such good service uh, to the farmers, to the world uh, in general, and they are not compatible with, with the current practice of, of reliance on pesticides and how important it is to have this integrated pest management practices and practices that will conserve the, the natural enemies that already exist um, in the, in the um, environment. So with that, I think we have a, a real treat of learning from these experts uh, today. Thank you very much to all our speakers and, and to uh, Kabi and Grow Asia for organizing this. Thank you very much, Rika. That was an excellent summary. Um, perfect. Uh, and I agree with you. It was just a real treat of uh, information and, and speakers uh, sharing what they're doing. I mean, it's, it's a great way to end the series. Uh, and uh, I just want to say um, to everyone that it is the last of the series, um, but we are looking at some technical workshop sessions for November to sort of carry on the momentum and to talk about uh, some of the more technical questions uh, and ways to do these things. And that's certainly what the ASEAN Action Plan is wanting to do as well, is to look at those institutional type questions and how we can work together regionally better to um, get some of these things out there and into the hands of farmers. So um, we will be in touch. Before we leave, I'd just like to thank everyone at the ASEAN on Action Plan, Grow Asia, particularly Graham and Prana for helping make this webinar a success, as well as our supporters and donors. And Grow Asia would very much like to thank Cabby uh, for your collaboration on this series. It was great to be working with you and uh, to continue working with you in the future uh, on this focus on biocontrol. It's always a pleasure to work with you, Roger and team. Um, a huge thank you to all the speakers across the entire webinar series over the last six weeks, and particularly to those ones today, just thank you again. Uh, and to all of you who are listening online, it's fantastic that so many people have taken part. Uh, we've had over uh, 1,100 people uh, register. It's probably t up to 2,000 now. Um, so thank you. Uh, and I'd like to call this series to an end uh, for October. Take a rest until November when we'll be back in contact. Until then, take care, everyone. Bye.